Haggai. The book of Haggai. Oh my goodness. Um, with that being said, a few people are under what I think Shane is pretty sick, so I don't know what, what the deal is the last I heard from her. So Maryland's uh getting long, getting long, so pray for Maryland. Keep that in your mind. So Haggai chapter one. Haggai chapter one. Let's pray. Father, what a uh, gracious opportunity we have that you've provided for us to come together to uh, break your bread among us, that we could spend time being fed from your word, uh, this great prophet to the people, speaking words uh, that was necessary for them to, again, regroup and, and be revived spiritually from within. Uh, reform was happening around them, but they needed from within. They needed, again, to grasp who you were and the importance and the priority of having you first in their lives. Father, thank you for the example of this uh, prophet. Thank you for the hearing about this uh, prophecy to these people that are very, very applicable to us today. And the implications are more than enough for us that we we should hear the word of the prophet praying, uh, uh, prying upon our ears that say, consider your ways. In Jesus' name, amen. we kind of left off. We did the history last week a little bit. And we did a little bit of the introduction to this book. Uh, it's not a long book, but it is quite interesting how it plays its part in the history of Israel as Israel was going back after captivity. Um, so it's not a long book. It's a couple of, uh, it's just two chapters, but within it, it's quite in depth. And the cry that you will hear, and I kind of said it in our opening prayer, uh, Consider your ways. I don't know what it is, but when sometimes when you're studying and and God has graciously given me the ability to study the Bible a lot more than most of you, so um, that's why I get to regurgitate on you. I'm probably a bad picture though. <laughs> um, but it it seems like in the forefront of my mind, what He keeps bringing up is we got to be invested with our mind and an understanding what the word is it's something we got to f- make ourselves and and I try not to use words that are too devious but we got to make ourselves think about the lord how many things in your life do you think about all day long that that come up and you got uh, this comes up and I got now I got to change to think about this and to think about the lord to consider what he's doing and I so not only are we considering and thinking about what he's done for us but in lieu of that we got to know what we're doing in light of that and it says, consider your ways. So maybe that's a, an interesting way to introduce this because um, what I think it does is it capsulizes uh, a few times in this book, consider your ways, consider your ways. Um, and I think that's important because what he wants us to know, do is, is recognize what we're doing, what we're doing. And kind of if you ever sat down and, and wrote out your day and what you did, to get things done for the family, which is, these are all necessary things, which you've done for extracurricular things, what what took your mind off of other things, and how often in that parenthesis called a day have you thought about the Lord? How, how often have you put Him in His proper place in that? And many of us will say, you know, Lord, I pray that Your will gets done today, and that's that's where we leave it and we walk off. But the idea of considering is engaging your brain. And I hate to be like that. We're in a time and day and age where in the church people don't want to engage their brain. They want, really want to be entertained. Um, it, it's, we're getting close to that time of the year with Easter. And there's going to be a lot of Easter entertainments. So if you want a good egg hunt, there's a couple of churches I could tell you about. I mean, seriously, you've got to think. When I was a kid, that was like the last place you would find. Out. Maybe a few churches would do that. Now, if you want a good egg hunt. Go to, there's a couple of churches. And you say, what, what does that have to do with Christianity? Where, what verse and where do you find that in the Bible? It's nothing to do with it. And, and you say, well, it's a ploy to evangelize. The, the Bible just never says, here's a ploy, evangelize. It just says, go, proclaim. And, I th- and that means engage your brain. And we want to engage people in activities. I'll never forget, I ha- in college, I know I'm going to chase a rabbit for one second, but I'm going to hunt it. I took a class in college basically about how to get people to attend your church. 
And the guy went through different things. And at the end of the, this one class, he says, you know, you can have a hot dog sale, but remember this. They're going to come back every Sunday wanting a hot dog. And before you know it, one Sunday to come back and say, where's the steak? Because you, you keep feeding them things. And, and if you said, if, if you look what the Lord did when he fed people to get the message, when he stopped feeding them, they disappeared. And he says, don't do that. Let the Lord feed them. So it's interesting in a class on how to get people to attend. Your, we did stuff on bus ministries and senior ministries and all this stuff. He actually said the hot dog sales are really like a really bad thing to do. You want people to be engaged because they're thinking. And that's, that's where, where Haggai is. He wants them to think. So we're going to pick up in verse 2 of chapter 1. Verse 2 of chapter 1. We're going to kind of flow through certain things. And as I do that, uh, the interesting thing I, I often see sometimes is, is words that come up. Um, um, and sometimes different versions of the Bible say it a little differently. And, I, and, I, and I'm picking up on a nuance. I think it's in the King James. But in verse 2 it says, Thus says the Lord of hosts, This people says the time has not come, even the time for the house of the Lord to be rebuilt. So here's what we're doing. We're, 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 it's, it's an interesting thing because uh, the people, and, and we're going to have to grasp, grasp what's going on, they had been deprived for years of their things. They had been taken into captivity. They have lost their ability to have their own homes, their own places. And I know when certain people get their own homes, it's like, this is my home, my domain. Uh, they didn't have their own homes. They were uh, exiled out of so when they came back in and were allowed to come back in and actually most of the building project was paid for by uh, the media uh, media Persian king which is interesting how would you like some foreign dignitary to pay for your rebuilding your home oh we do that in America don't we don't we when we allow people to repatriate to their own nations we pay for the destructions that was done so we kind of understand that because there's a lot of countries we did quite a lot of damage to and we help rebuild. Uh, and it's at our cost. But these people came back, and, and, and as they're looking out over the landscape and, and the vacant area where the temple would be, they, they basically said, it's not time for us to deal with the house of the Lord. It's not time. But here's what I want us to pick up on, and I think this is a, a really important. Um, the terminology used here. Uh, the King James doesn't say, oh, my version is the New American Standard. It says, this people... You see that? I don't know if anybody has something different in verse 2. Let me know because that's not... I think the King James is really neat. It says, these people. Uh, it's, it's, it's kind of similar. But when... What? In, in what version you have? NIV. Okay. I like these people because it kind of... There's a distance there, isn't it? If you're kind of with a group of people and you say, this people. This people. When you say these people, you're kind of pointing out these people. You get the kind of, it's a distance that's been there. The reason I'm putting it, bringing it up, because it's interesting. How often has God called the people of Israel these people? Think about this. It's very important because terminology, when you say things, you, you, you say things by that. Um, Lizzie and I used to fool around and, with certain things. And I said, can you take care of your daughter? So what am I saying by that? If she's behaving like that, can't be my kid. It was never Sam. <laughs> but, but you say certain things for, for reasons, right? And we've got to see what's the terminology. Here's the interesting thing. When God talks about his people, he calls them my people over a hundred times in the Bible. He'll say, these are my people. And we'll look at it in a second in, in a very specific place. But not once does he ever call them my people in the book of Haggai. Just listen to that for a second. It's very important. Because I think it's interesting, as God is dealing with this nation, and, and is still dealing with them, remember they were sent out of and into exile because they were being punished. Right? And coming back in, you think after punishment, this rebellious nation would go to their God and, under, and learn something from this time of training, and they've learned nothing. Uh, go to Jeremiah chapter 5. Go to Jeremiah chapter 5. And we're talking again about the idea of the punishment that's that's invicted here, uh, invoked here. Uh, 
We'll start in verse 29. Jeremiah 5, 29. And interesting, because since they are his people, then God has called them my people. He has the right to discipline them too, right? And I don't mean always in an egregious form. He's training them and trying to uh, get them to understand what he's done for them. And he says in verse 29, verse, uh, Jeremiah 5, 29, Shall I not punish these people? See the terminology there? Shall I not punish these people, declares the Lord, uh, on a nation such as this shall I not avenge myself? In other words, he's trying to keep the integrity of his name. And if he, if he, it, it's the same thing family. You say there's certain uh, status we want to hold up as a family, certain kind of presentation we're going to make, and somebody in the family is not doing it. You want them to reflect you. So God's saying, they're not reflecting me. Yes. Five to, no. <laughs> Okay, which what are we talking about? The very first verse I said. Okay, very first verse is Haggai chapter two, chapter one, verse two, and it says this people. I said in the King James, it says these people, or in the NIV. I think we got King James because she said. I thought she said NASB. No, NIV. Oh. NIV. Okay, now with that idea, it does say these people in in Jeremiah five twenty nine. That's where we're at now. Sorry, that's fine. Okay, uh, yours says these things. Okay, uh, well, the, the understanding is he's talking about people, um, uh, and he shall, shall punish these people. It, it could be these things, but how do you punish these things? Yeah, it has things probably in the side column. Yeah, but you can't punish things, you know, for these things. Okay, for these things. Well, you're punishing the people for these things. So either way, it's still saying the same thing, kind of. Um, Verse 30, though, says, An appalling and horrible thing has happened in the land. I think this is interesting. An appalling and horrible thing has happened in the land. So the people are so attached to the land. So when we talk about Israel, we're also talking about the land. Verse 31 says, The prophets prophesy falsely. So this is what's going on in the land. The priests rule on their own authority. So the, the, the levels that God has placed for communication to Him and from Him, they're not doing it correctly. And listen... And my people love it so. Isn't that interesting? How does it not apply for today? Do you know how many people in the church love to hear false teaching and don't even know it? I mean, you, you, it's out there. Um, I've, I've spent, I don't know how much time in the last two years looking at different things that are out there. And all of a sudden, they're going perfectly fine. They've got a good doctrinal stand. They're biblical. And all of a sudden, they add one little word and they go, Phew. and they go, where did that word come from? It's not even in the text. But they say, that really fits well for what I want to teach. And boom, they go off into some teaching. And they're not teaching what the Bible says. Now they're teaching what they want it to say. And that's why we try to look as much as we can at the words and see what they say. Um, But notice what he says here in the end of Jeremiah, verse 31. He says, but what will will you do at the end of it? Like when, when it comes to the end, what will you do? Here's the interesting thing that kind of runs parallel to this. I am one of the strangest people you ever meet. I, I want to make sure the means justify the end. People will say, well, look at the end result. At the end result, you know, God's in charge of the end result. We have to be responsible how we get there. And I think one, the most important thing is to be biblical on how we do things. God's in charge of the ends. Did you not, I, I think we should all know that by now. So if we're giving the gospel to somebody, we, do, we can't do things to placate them or to tickle their ears. We've got to say what the God says about the gospel. And some people will change it just a little bit because they want that person not to feel so bad or feel good or make a decision. But it's what the Bible says. Because what we're trying to do is say, oh, look, I brought this person to the Lord. I want to convert or whatever it is. And you say, no, 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 that's God's job. The ends are God's job. Last I checked, the end is up to God anyway, right? And that, and and that's how we look at that. But um, anyway, um, look at Numbers thirty-two. Since we're talking about these people and my people, I think it's in, uh, important to grasp how this is used. Numbers chapter thirty-two. In this people, yeah. Um, I 
But you, you got you to understand, God, you know, for you to say this is my kids that's, or my whatever it is, even your things, this is mine. There's a possession and, and a pride that's involved in that. When you say this thing, it kind of now you're distance, distancing yourself from it. And in Numbers 32, verse 15. And, and Moses is talking to the children as they're wandering the wilderness. Uh, and he tells the sons of God and the sons of Reuben to be aware of an angry God. Because notice what he says. Um, let's go to verse 14. Now behold, Numbers thirty-two, fourteen. Now behold, you have risen up in your father's place, a brood of sinful men, to add still more to the burning anger of the Lord against Israel. For if you turn away from following him, he will once more abandon them in the wilderness and you will destroy all these people. And, and I'm not trying to beat to death the idea of these people, but these, these people are, uh, coincides or runs parallel to their attitude. What's their attitude like about God? What's their attitude and decisions about it? Uh, how have they alienated themselves from the Lord? There's an old joke that says, you know, I, I, I've been, been with the Lord for so long and I don't feel close to him. If God's in the driver's seat, he can't move. If you feel distant from him, who moved? You know, he, you've moved. God doesn't move. And, and we alienate God sometimes by the things and how we behave. And most importantly, by a mental attitude, how we think. And guess what's really cool about that? Nobody knows but God. Think about that one. Um, now, here's what's happened by the time we get to Haggai, why Haggai is dealing with it in such a, a rash manner. He, he says 16 years they've been back in the land. They've established their homes. They've, they've established themselves. They feel comfortable being there. There's a comfort zone. But no work has been done in the temple. Uh, it had been started. But I think the law of thermodynamics kicks in after 16 years, don't you think? If something started and not completed, now it's turning to rubble. What? The law of what? Entropy, which says? Everything. Listen, I'm going to tell you something. I've been and seen enough cars laying around the road that don't work, and they don't get better by just sitting there. I've never seen a car that sits for 16 years, and all of a sudden now it looks like a new model. Okay, you've got to spend time working on it, keeping it up. Um, and going back to Haggai, listen what's, what's in, involved in this. I think it's important as we look at this in verse 2. It says, thus says the Lord of hosts to these people. Now, Lord of hosts is used by Haggai. Now, here's the difference. What I say, I said in Haggai, he never uses the term my people. But Haggai uses the term Lord of hosts 11 times. 11 times. Let's compare it for a second. Because we're dealing with the last three books here in the Old Testament. Okay? The Lord of Hosts is, is used 11 times in Haggai. It's used 53 times in Zechariah. And it's used 24 times in Malachi. So we 88 times in the last books of the Old Testament. So this term must have some significance. You think? Um, and I think sometimes we've got to look at the words and say, why is it? Now when you say Lord of Hosts, that means little to me. I don't even know what... To me, a host of a party is the guy that's like making you feel comfortable. The Lord is not making you feel comfortable because what it means is the Lord of armies. Uh, and and when, we, when it refers to that, the Lord himself saying this, these three pro prophets are encouraging uh, or trying to encourage uh, a, 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 and, 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 and help out a defenseless Judah in the face of enormous... Uh, Oh, I put it here purposely because uh, Lizzie and I, I almost said mom. You guys are, who are you talking about? Lizzie and I have been talking about the word. You know what? The, there's a new word out there. I don't know how long it's been out there called ginormous. And I, to, it's, wait, what I mean by new, thank you people, is it's generational. It hasn't been around when I was a kid. Um, we try to make everything gi something, you know. But ginormous. Um, but here's where Judah is. The, the prophets, these last three prophets are trying to encourage a defenseless Judah in the face of ginormous uh, peril. They're facing an imperial power called Persia. Now, here's why I have a problem with ginormous. What's the difference between ginormous and enormous? It's a bigger 
It can't be bigger. It's enormous. <laughs> enormous is enormous. Ginormous is just enormous. <laughs> it's just enormous. Um, I'm just having fun with mom. I go, oh, look, it's ginormous lashes. I think that's a commercial I saw it on. The lady has ginormous lashes. I go, aren't they just enormous or just big or just lashes? <laughs> Let's be technical. I don't know what ginormous. Anyway, but I will say this, though. As little Israel's coming back, they, haven't, they once again are in the same place they started as they started in the wilderness. They're not a mighty force. They're not a great army. Um, most of them have been in captivity. That means they were enslaved for years. What do they know? Which is interesting because the people that came out of Egypt were enslaved. So they're basically at the same place. And what they have to look to is the Lord of Armies. God is in charge of not only him as a mighty force, but the people that are coming at them. Uh, you know, God can curb that. And as they look at that, they should, this, this terminology is what I'm trying to get at, this terminology, Lord of hosts, should give, give them great security and should give them great comfort knowing God is in charge and God can take care of it. And when, sometimes when we look inwardly, um, we're in, we're in a bad place. And again, these people were very comfortable in their homes. Uh, yet at the same time, they were, they were concerned about the enemy around them. Uh, so, and notice what it says. It goes on to say, this time has not come. Uh, thus says the Lord of hosts, these people say, this is what's being said, this, this time has not come, uh, even the time for the house of the Lord to be rebuilt. Uh, here's the interesting thing. Let's get a time frame on this. This is really interesting. Going back to verse 1, it says, It's the second year of Darius, the first day of the sixth month. So first day of the sixth month means it's a new moon. Okay, a new moon and a, new, and a Sabbath and the first of the month would mean it's a very special day. And what happens is during this time, a large audience would gather. Um, it was required by males to be in Jerusalem to make sacrifices at certain times of the year. But we know since these sacrifices were made, there would be a large crowd in what was called the temple area. There's no temple. There's just an altar, but there would be a large crowd there. So, so basically, God is speaking to Haggai, and Haggai is going to speak to the people. And the people had said, in, not only by their words, but by their actions, the time hasn't come. Uh, and we'll see as we go through this how they say the time hasn't come. Uh, uh, when you say the time hasn't come, no, don't you have to do, base it on a clock? Think about it for a minute. If I say the time hasn't come for something, I'm basing it on a clock. And, and obviously this is uh, an interesting way to look at that because they say, well, we do have our houses. Uh, we do have time to build our houses, didn't we? This is their rationale. Listen, this is important because I want you to understand how they base their clock on things. They're basing, first of all, part of their clock is based on a rationale. They say, we've had time. We need to build our houses first. We need the comfort and safety of our home. The next part is they have opposition. Or should I say it like this? They have supposed opposition that they could not supposedly suppress. They weren't looking to God. They were looking out. Okay, when you look out at things and you say things and see things, that's called empirical. That's empiricism. How do I see things? What do I know? Um, so I look at things and say, well, that really can't be real. That can't. So they're, they're dealing with rationale. They're dealing with empiricism. And what are people supposed to be dealing with? Those are the two types how people believe things, believe it or not. The Hebrew people were to not look around them, not think what's rational, they were to look up to God. They were supposed to live by faith. They were living by rationales and by sight, empiricism. And so right away, if you're doing that, your clock is off by miles. Get what I'm saying? Uh, your, t your, t your time becomes God's time, and it's not supposed to be like that. God's time is supposed to be your time. Uh, how many times have we made excuses as of to why we can't do something for the Lord? 
just kind of think about that. And what we're doing is saying, okay, I can't do this because, and we're going to even rationalize it, or we're going to look at something empirically, but we're not going to look at it. If the Lord's put it on your heart, let's do it by faith. Step out by faith. Uh, faith isn't blind. It's God says clearly in the Word of God. For instance, God says we are to give the gospel out to people. How many times have we been confronted with somebody who said, we're really on our heart, we should say something to this person, and we don't do it. What are we doing in our head? Why we don't do it? We're usually rationalizing, oh, I, you know, I don't want to embarrass them, or it's not the right place, not the right time. But who just put it? First of all, the Lord says, do it. No matter what you may be kind of feel like inside that the Spirit's moving you. you just, so I always said, do it. And if you see an opportunity to hear a word, you say, oh, oh there's, there's an opening right there. You know, let's do this. Um, and I, I think it's really hard because most people want to know what the will of God is. And God says so many times in the Bible, here's my will, ba ba ba, And we don't do it. Now, how many times have you not been thankful for something? You say, ah. the Lord says it is his will for us to always give thanks. Always give thanks for everything. And I said, well, no, I don't want to get, you know, how many of you have, you know, I had a case of chiggers. Thank you, Lord. <laughs> and you say, that's ridiculous. No, Lord, thank you. Could have been a lot worse. <laughs> you know, uh, I don't know about you, but the, the last season I got those oak mites on my neck. And I, those things are nastier. I thought chiggers were bad. They're awful. And I said, man, I could have chiggers coming up, but oak mites going down. And they, <laughs> you know, mosquitoes in the middle. I would have been a mess. Uh, I had the mosquitoes, believe me. Uh, I, I will take mosquitoes over chiggers and oak mites. Probably in that order. But uh, they're just. But, but, but what we do, we have a tendency as human beings, um, not necessarily bad per se, but when it overrides the will of God, it's wrong and it's sinful. But we, when we say we intend to do something, I intend to do this for the Lord, and we don't because we rationalize a different outcome um, or something else influences us or we saw something happen to somebody else that tried the same thing, so now we're all going on empiricism. Um, uh, I just say we have to understand that what we need to do is walk by faith, and these people were not a good example of that. Uh, um, I've heard this too. I really need to do this in my life. And, and to make it some more spiritually sound, I need to do whatever, such and such. But today's not a good time. Or this isn't a good time. I have to wait till it's a good time in my life to, do, to address that. Um, that is really susceptible to a lot of things. Because only God knows how much you have to live and... and you may not have time to do that, you know. Uh, I, there's nothing wrong with making plans in such and such a time to do such and such a thing. James says that. But we're supposed to be doing what the Lord wills as we're doing those things uh, and preparing those things. Notice what it says in verses 3 and 4. Um, and this is what, what we have to see. We, we have the setup of what's going on, what their attitudes are like. But what, what is actually the happening within these realm of people. Verse 3 says, And the word of the Lord came to Haggai, the prophet, saying, so verse 3 is very self-explanatory. I don't think it has a whole lot to say, but it is interesting, though. It says over and over again in this book, the word of the Lord came to Haggai. So when Haggai is speaking, who is he speaking? He's speaking God's word. I think sometimes we lose that. I don't want to belabor it. But when we're reading the Bible, we're reading God's word. It's him speaking. Um, I think it's real easy. And, and I'm going to say this probably, I don't know how many times. People today want to hear God speak. He's speaking. Read it out loud if you need to hear it. It'll be your voice, his, his words. But God speaks here. And he's speaking to Haggai, who's the prophet who's going to record it. And here's what God says. So if you want to know what God says, he says this. It is time for you yourselves to dwell in panel houses while this house lies desolate. It's a simple question God asks and puts them. Uh, he's, he's saying, is it time for you to dwell in your paneled houses? Which is an interesting thing because I, I kind of thought about it and I said, my house isn't paneled. <laughs> it was at some point. I think paneling is a 70s thing, isn't it? 70s? Kind of passe. Uh, that's what we think of paneling, isn't it? Usually when you think of paneling, you think of that, that wood look that Somebody decided to put in the house and thought, that really looks cool. Uh, I thought I never thought it looked good, um, maybe on the floor. <laughs> but I want you to see this because I think it's interesting as we get this. Um, 
Bible explains the Bible, right? 1 Kings chapter 6. 1 Kings chapter 6. This is a time for Solomon, and Solomon was building the temple. What they were or what they were trying to attempt to do, and they had failed to do. So, in the sixteen years of silence, this is what God was telling them to do: was to build this temple. So it's really cool when you go to look at this and you say, "I got it." See, they were building houses, and they were uh, paneled houses. Now, I think most of us in this this room uh, have paneled houses. And I'll show you why. <laughs> uh, it's, it's, but it carries over from Solomon here in chapter 6, 1 Kings chapter 6, verse 9. It says, so he built the house and he finished it. He built the house of the Lord, the temple. He finished it and he covered the house with beams and planks of cedar. Okay? And he also built the stories. And, and again, if you, if you have uh, a Bible, that idea of planks of cedar is the idea of he paneled it. He paneled this house. Okay, in chapter 7, verse 3, it says, and it was paneled. It's talking still about Solomon's palace now. He he says it was paneled paneled with cedar uh, above the side chambers, which were were on 45 pillars, 15 in each row. So when Solomon built the palace, he paneled it. Verse 7, and and same chapter, 1 Kings 7, 7. And he made the hall of the throne where he was to judge, the hall of judgment, and it was paneled with cedar from floor to floor. Now, the equivalent today, um, as we were looking at this, the, God's house is to be paneled. What, what, when we say paneled, what do we really mean? God's house has a certain decor to it. All our houses have some decor. Uh, whether we uh, like each other's homes, that's it, our business, some of us, uh, may have more personal things, and we decorate them with nothing but Stephanie's pictures. That's just a joke of Stephanie's listen. I mean, you, we may have a lot of pictures in our house of family. Some people may have um, some famous painters' paintings. Some people may have flowered sofas or solid sofas or whatever they might want. But they, they huh? Or both? Or, or, you can find or, or, two, or two beanbag chairs and a, and a, and a little TV tray or whatever. Um, but we all, do, we all. But when we do that, we we call them finished and comfortable. So, so when we finish a house, we, it's it's considered paneled and it's considered decorated and set. Um, yes. Sealed. Uh, ceiling. Ceiling. Covered. Covered. Well, because when you panel the walls and you finish them, you cover them. It's both. It's both the walls and the ceiling. Um, but the idea is it's finished. Um, when we talk about these homes, they're finished, and I like to put the uh, uh, the idea, it's 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 home. Where when we walk in, it's a finished, done. None of us want to walk into a home that just has, you know, two by fours up and not finished. We want to finish products. So so when when God, sorry, Anna, <laughs> shouldn't have said that. So. Um, but here's the here's I want you to see the irony. God is saying to them here in Haggai. So let's go back to Haggai, and I really want you to see what God is saying. It's time for yourselves to dwell in your panel house. He says, he seems like you don't have time for me, but you've had time to complete, and I think the best way to put it, complete and decor your own homes. You've had time for that. Um, while my house lays what? Desolate. It hasn't even begun. And, and that's the irony behind it. When, uh, it's, it's interesting. Uh, God's house by Solomon was... Um, not necessarily richly appointed, but it was finished. When when Solomon did it, he finished. Then he moved on to his palatial estates. Uh, when you have a building project, don't you start with certain things? I want to do phase one. I want to do this. Phase two, do this. So on and so forth. Um, um, these people, um, these people. I'm going to use it again. These people were concerned about themselves. Period. Case closed. There's no other, nothing else we can put there. And what Haggai is trying to do is get them to understand by very simple verbiage, get your priorities straight. Get your priorities straight. Um, 
I kind of put it like this. They got to get on God's clock. Remember when I said, what clock are you working with? They got to get on God's clock. Um, obviously, if God's saying something, it's been 16 years awaiting. Uh, wow, what are they doing? It's, it's interesting because Haggai was saying this. And I want you to see this. It's interesting. He's saying this specifically to Zerubbabel in verse 1 and to, and to Joshua. Uh, basically, what he's saying this to is the governor of the people and the high priest. So he's addressing two people, two types of representatives to the people. Um, and, and two people who were set at, uh, in their place by, uh, by God. To govern, to rule over the people, to be a godly example is ruling, and a priest to govern the the religious state of the people, um, and a high priest was supposed to go into the holy of holies once a year. Sixteen years have passed. Where does this high priest been doing? And notice what it says here in verse one: It's Joshua, the son of Z- uh, Jehozadak, the high priest. Now, the reason I say Joshua, Joshua is the high priest, because he's the son of a high priest. It would make him a high priest, but he's not a functional high priest because he's got no place to high priest at. Get the picture? You got to high priest, you got to go into the Holy of Holies. There is no Holy of Holies, so he's basically unemployed. Kind of get the picture? Um, so these people who have spent 16 years in the land have had plenty of time to rebuild the temple. They, uh, uh, but and it's interesting because we will see that within four years they'll they'll finish the temple, so it's only a four year project. So they've had sixteen years of just do the math. They could have built four temples. <laughs> they didn't build one. They didn't even lay a stone to it. And uh, and I can almost picture because when the original temple was destroyed, I don't think they carried off all the stones that it was made out of. I think they just destroyed it, and all the stones were laying there. They needed, and we'll see uh, within a few verses, uh, verse 8, it says, go up to the mountains, bring wood. Why didn't you say go to the quarry, bring rock? You need wood for the supports to put the stone against. The stone was there. Just think about it for a minute. God's saying, go get the wood. Let's start the framing, I guess is the best way to put it. Put the framework up. Um, Which is interesting because the the height of selfishness, think about it. These people had put their time. Remember, it's their time, and now's not the right time. So I don't know what time it was if their houses were finished. What are they doing with their time? Just me thinking. Um, they, they put their time into their business. What? Cable. Yeah, we're cable. <laughs> they, they had lots of dish network. Um, they were on their own time. They they had put forth their own effort. They had put forth their money into their own things. So it was all about their personal... Uh, I, the best way I could say it is they had great 401ks, but they had no future. Because without God, there's no future. So you could say, look at my account, and and God would say, okay, where are you going to spend it? Because in like two seconds, I could put you back out of this country, back out of the land. Where Didn't you, didn't you just get this? Seventy years is considered a generation. A whole generation had spent outside the land. All these people were probably raised up outside this land. And now he's bringing them back into the land, and they, they didn't learn the lessons their parents should have easily have learned. Uh, so Haggai now turns to the people in verse 5. He says, Now therefore, thus says the Lord of hosts, consider your ways. Um, I think a, a more literal way of saying that is set your heart on these things. Well, why? Why does it say consider your Again, the heart in the Old Testament is not this uh, beating thing in your chest. It's your brain. It's your thoughts. Just like cardia is in the New Testament, leb in the Old Testament is the same thing. Put your mind on these things. You know, I think sometimes we get lost with certain goofy term- terminology um, that we don't realize if we put our hearts on something, it's, it's the same terminology as using your mind. You're, you're thinking about something. Uh, which is again interesting because what they're what they're doing is uh, uh, man i'm going to say something they're missing out on an, an immense blessing god has done for them for no what no what he's done for no other nation and they've come back um uh, ungrateful i don't know how else to put that and you say well they've been disciplined they've, they've lost everything they come back here but god supplied everything that they needed 
And somebody else is paying for it. I don't know, it sounds pretty good to me, you know. I'm not a socialist, please understand this, but it's it's kind of interesting that somebody's foot God has so, so seen fit that a, uh, and and if you know anything about the Persian Empire, it's not a nice empire. They're very cruel and very vicious, and later a couple of generations from this this setup that that they're involved in under Darius first, um here in Haggai, um, Esther will be put try, ha, under Haman will be threatened to kill all the Jews. So it's only a few years from this, maybe 70, 80 years from this. So God can anytime allow somebody to rise up to want to destroy these people. And now there's a time for blessing. And what have they reached out to get? They're not blessed. They're not worshiping God. Uh, they can't. And he says, consider your ways. And here's what he, say, what he says. Uh, um. And, and I'm going to say something. We don't always focus on the loss and the loss of blessings by not having our correct priorities. So here's what he says in verse 6. You have sown much, but you harvest little. Oh, let me tell you what else going on. That helps me. It's the first of, of kind of September area. It's harvest time. So they had sown. And it says here, much. Um, most of the time farmers like to overseed things so they can get whatever. Uh, sometimes not all the seed germinates. So they, and they, you've sown a lot. And what have you harvested? So far you've gotten little. And the first fruits were to go to God. Uh, maybe they hadn't done this. Which again focuses on an interesting thing. First fruits, the grain, was to go to God. The second one here says, uh, you eat, but there's not enough to be satisfied. You, you have uh, you have drink, but there's not enough to become drunk. And I don't think that's you're purposely doing that. But you, they couldn't; they didn't have anything, uh, uh, and that just shows the lack. Uh, it says you put on clothing, but it's not; it's not. No one is warm enough. So basically, instead of it being a good solid clothing, it's worn through. It's it's dismal to keep people warm. Uh, he who earns, earns wages and puts it in purses with holes. Uh, kind of think of the, I, I don't know, maybe this is a bad analogy. I think of the depression on that one. You would, you would earn a day's living and all of that would go for what? Like one loaf of bread. What did you get from, you worked all day, uh, maybe a 10 or 12 hour day and you went home and you bought a loaf of bread to go home to split amongst you and the family. Uh, that kind of thing. You earn rations for everything and yet you worked hard and you did earn money. But the money wasn't worth anything. Or, or, or on the other side, it could mean you spent it too fast. They could just say, okay, I got all this money. Let me just go buy things for myself. And there are people that live that. Uh, do, do you know that most of America lives way beyond its means? And most of America says, oh, we don't get enough money. No, you spend too much. Because they, they, they all want to be millionaires. You know, I want to make that list of millionaires or billionaires. But you can't do it when you spend everything and spend above what you have. It's a simple, you know, I'm going to say something very easily. This is a financial, I am not a financial planner, nor do I play one on TV. But it's really easy. If you make so much money, you spend that much money or you save some of it. If you can't make ends meet, you get another job. I know that sounds terrible. I, I, I was counseling a young man years ago and he says, we just can't make ends meet. And I go, how many hours a week do you work? He goes, 30. I go, son, you got about 90 hours to waste. Go get another job. He goes, I can't work that much. I go, why? Were well, you better than our forefathers? You know, I grew up with a dad that woke up at 6 o'clock in the morning, and I saw him like 10 o'clock at night. That's it. It's life. He had to make a living. Uh, he, and I knew about 90% of his life he worked two jobs. He, he didn't die from that. He didn't die from working. Uh, you know, um, but what happens is sometimes, and, and, and within this framework, I didn't want to get off on a financial uh, conference, but, but sometimes we, we got to line up with what we're earning, what we're spending, and sometimes we're, we may be put in situations that we can't afford what's going on. We, things may inflate to astronomical proportions. Are we prepared for that? Uh, but, but do you not see God controlling these elements? They've eaten, they've, they've harvested, they've sown, they harvest little, Who's in charge of the rain and the growth and germinating the seeds? 
God is. They eat, they're not satisfied. Now I'm thinking um, it could go either way with that, and we could talk about that at some other time, but I'm just looking at cause and effect. Who's in charge of this cause and effect? Um, and Haggai says these cause and effects demand their attention. They should be attentive to what's going on. They neglected God's house, and they have total lack of success in everyday living. Do you see the cause and effect <laughs> kind of idea? Uh, and, I, and I hate when people do this, and, and sometimes we've got to be very careful. Don't look at this, and I'll plug this into somebody's life and say, if you did this, God would bless you here. He's talking to these people. So let's keep it case-specific. Because I don't know what's going on in other people's lives unless God reveals it. But I do know we should always make God a priority. And, um, and in this case, the people were suffering ill effects in their lives because they did not put God first. And God's saying, hey, wake up. I put you in the land. And remember, to Israel, to be in the land was to be the place of milk and honey. God was going to bless the land and make it prosperous and make them prosperous in the land. He had promised them that. He didn't promise me that. So just kind of get the picture. So he's dealing with the people that's very, very much a part of the land. And this, this providential God, I like that because we see Esther later, he'll be the providential God, is in charge of them and cares for them. And they've done nothing to reap the benefits of it, which, was a, which is easy. Go back to the beginning. We want to be biblical, right? God says what? Have no other gods before me. Put me first. That's what that first commandment says. Put, and what do they say? Oh, we got the commandments on the wall. You want to see where I got it? I got a picture frame on my beautiful paneled house. I, I show you. I got the Ten Commandments. I got to post it up in my house. You can read it in Hebrew, and I've even got it in 14 other languages. But it doesn't mean anything because I don't adhere to it. That's the kind of idea that's going on. Uh, Um, listen, and, and, and again, you want an Old Testament economy. And uh, as we look at this, the Old Testament economy fir- firmly believed in a God who provided, a God who controlled the elements, a God whose elements were at their disposal and hit at his disposable, dispose, disposal, even if he wanted to bring them discipline through the elements. So... When you go out there and you sow and you do everything you need to, to get a fruitful harvest and nothing comes up, the first thing you've got to ask yourself as a Hebrew people, what's, what's my relationship? What's happened with me and God? Don't do that yourselves now because that's not what's being said. But here is what's going on in that. It's, you know, and remember, everything at that time was designed so that God could educate these people. They didn't have a Bible to sit down with. They had the prophets, they had the priests, but they didn't actually have the word of God. And, and the interesting thing is God educates. He, he sometimes puts us before a very, a very hard test, a very deep trial, and it's only to deepen our spiritual life, not to wreck us. Our walk with God or our dependence on him as a source of life so that things that happen in our lives happen with purpose, with direction. How often does something happen? And Anna, please, it's not about you, but, but, but I said the same thing myself. Uh, when we go through something very difficult, uh, what does God wish for us to learn? I don't think there's anything wrong with applying that. In the situations that happen to us today, uh, I had a very difficult time after Hurricane Andrew trying to figure out how to piece this together and keep a family sane with little kids and, and, and all sorts of things going on. And I said, and then contra- contractors that were thieves, that, that's why I said the arm's length trans- transaction. Um, but God, God wanted to teach me something, and it took me a long time to sit down and say, okay, Lord, I got to get, what do you want me to learn from this? And can't you teach somebody else? <laughs> I'll be honest, you know, I've had, you know, I mean, it was like one trial after another, after another, after another, and we were slowly, things were coming around, and, you know, I was looking at a place that uh, I was about ready to say, you know, I could have a fire sale, but I have to have the fire first. (laughs) Um, But, I mean, I'm looking at different things, and, and at some point, if you would like, we could sit down, but God had to teach me some lessons. And it took me a long time to sit down. Even when I sat down and said, okay, Lord, what do you have for me to learn? I walked away and said, I'm a really horrible student. I didn't want to learn the lessons. Here. And I knew what they were. A few of them I knew. Um, what am I really, this is going to sound crazy, I had to give the gospel to my contractor who I wanted to see if my hands would fit 
perfectly around his throat. Well, seriously. And um, when we were in court together and I was, he, he looked at me, he says, I want to meet you at your house tomorrow. I go, okay. <laughs> and know what he said? He came over and this is, it's not, it's, it's interesting because God put me in a very bad place because I didn't want to do it. He said, what makes you different than all the other people that are trying to sue me and do stuff? And I, and I step back and I go, am I really that different? Uh, that checks you at the door. God says, here, Eric, you're facing it right now. Can you learn something? And I spent time giving that guy the gospel. And that guy came back and helped me finish my house, even though he's a thief. But we finished my house. But I looked at that and I said, Lord, that was a good opportunity. I don't know if he ever came to the Lord. I don't know. But he did hear the gospel from me. Um, because I told him I was going to kill him. And I wanted him to go to heaven when he died. I did. I said, <laughs> in the empty shell. I said, honest. That's a great way to give the gospel out. <laughs> but, however, it was a good opportunity because we were alone. And he, and he did. And, um, and to this day, I still know his name and nobody, nobody else's name that was involved with that. But... Uh, Prepare to meet you. Yes. <laughs> uh, but as we look at this, I want to just close with verse 6 and, and, f- and finish some things off here, and we'll pick up next week. Um, God addresses five natural things. These are all natural things. Think about it. Isn't harvesting and sowing a, a natural thing? Isn't eating and drinking? I mean, I don't know anything much more natural than eating and drinking, getting dressed, earning a living. Aren't these kind of natural things? Uh, things with unnatural repercussions that befell Israel. And it begs the question, and what it begs the question, what a great place to end. Verse 5 says, Now therefore, consider your ways. Verse 7 says, Consider your ways. So it's bookend by, are you really thinking about what you're doing? Are you really getting your priorities straight? Have you turned and taken a look at your thoughts, your activities, who your God is? Have you taken a look at it? Or are you just looking about and feeling comfortable in your paneled houses? And I think sometimes when we uh, have abnormalities, I guess, in our lives or see abnormalities, um, focus on what, what God wants us to learn and consider our ways. Now, I'm not saying do things and say God will give us something. But in this case, what he's saying is prioritize me. And maybe it's a time when we have things that happen in our lives. We just got to put God first. I don't think that's so difficult. But yet many of us fail to do that. And even in the minutest of tasks we do, the smallest of things we try to accomplish, God's in the side burner and we only call him when, when it's a foxhole situation, when all hell is breaking loose. We quick make a quick call and God's there. But what about the little things? Um, just kind of look at this. Uh, we got two seconds. So they, they, had sown, they had sown much. They harvested little. Uh, the prospects were glooming. Um, I, I equate this to the futures market. The future market depends on how much is, we're, we're getting. And the futures market was dropping because this is harvest time and they're, they're selling little. And there's no, that would be no prospects for a later time because if, if they're reaping little now and they've sown a lot, there's not going to like, oh, we'll wait another month. It'll be okay. They've got to go through a whole season. Do you understand that? A whole season. Um, and they, they, they ate but it was not enough to be satisfied. Obviously, it's going to get worse because they're not harvesting anything. Uh, they drank, not enough to get drunk. Uh, basically, what it means, literally, it means they were still thirsty. That's what it means. Not that they got not enough to get drunk. It's, it means not enough to get filled. The, no matter how much you drink, there was still a thirst. I look at it like this. What they were drinking had poor quality. Uh, that's kind of uh, not necessarily quantity. The quality was poor. They're still left to thirst. Uh, uh, they put clothes on, uh, but no one was warm. Again, the material goods were insufficient. Made in whoever, wherever you want to say. I don't want to. Uh, I pick, put on a shirt the other day. It says "Made in Pakistan." It's in, it's you know I'm going Pakistan. The, the, don't we have somebody closer to home making anything? Uh, they earn wages again, and uh, it was basically easy come, easy go. So they they were they dealt with. Uh, Poverty from failure, crop failure, clothes were threadbare, 
Um, they had their liquid assets were liquidated, uh, kind of thing. Uh, these people had an indifference toward holy things, and it affected their natural uh, things, the, the normal things, their everyday life. They were unproductive. They were impoverished. They were dissatisfied. Kind of sounds like people today, doesn't it? What was the, what's the priority of people today with God? Okay. Uh, so God wants them to become the people that consider their ways. Consider your ways. Let's pray. Father God, what a humbling thought as we looked in the Haggai tonight that, that we've been kind of confronted with too, that how often do we not put you first? How often do we look at our material comforts, the things around us, the, the ability to have and to get, but we don't, we, we don't realize that you're a God who is in control of everything. And in any, in any moment, uh, that could be stopped. And Father, we need to co- continually in everything we do, uh, put you first, seek you first. Uh, uh, it says it very clear in Matthew, seek your kingdom and all these things will be added unto you. And the things we want are the things that will have eternal value. Father, help us to again focus on the, on putting you first in Jesus' name. Amen.